let you know, um, we're a bit restricted for time today as I have an earlier flight to Auckland, so um, I'll probably be here for about half an hour, but we'll do our very best. Um, today I have Tertiary Skills and Employment Minister Stephen Joyce to join me to give an update on the results so far from our apprenticeship uh, reboot subsidy, which I announced in January of this year. Also earlier today you will have seen that Stephen announced the government is making an interim investment in Team New Zealand of $5 million to retain key members while a decision is made on whether to enter the 35th America's Cup. So we'll run through the details of that apprenticeship update and take any questions on that and the government's interim investment in Team New Zealand, then Stephen can leave and we can move on to other matters uh, you'd like to discuss today. So in terms of the apprenticeship update, in January this year I announced the government would be boosting the number of New Zealand apprenticeships, including providing a $28 million subsidy for employers and workers to take on more apprentices. With the rebuilding of Christchurch and the housing construction boom in Auckland, there is a big opportunity over the next few years to train more New Zealanders in vocational careers that will set them up for their working lives while supporting economic growth in the country. Alongside the new nationwide New Zealand apprenticeships, uh, which will open to all ages from 1 January next year, the reboot subsidy will help boost the number of apprentices in this country. Results so far are impressive. 8,000 new apprentices have signed up in just seven months uh, since the scheme came into effect, and interest has come from right across the country. This is an increase of 62% of people starting apprenticeships compared to the same period last year. What is also encouraging is that two-thirds of all apprentices who have signed up have been in the designated priority trades such as construction and infrastructure. This is a great achievement and I'll hand over to Stephen to run through more of the details. Thank you Prime Minister. So under the $28 million reboot subsidy that started on the 6th of March this year, the first 10,000 new apprentices who sign up for training are eligible to receive $1,000 towards the cost of their tools and off-job uh, course costs, or $2,000 for those in priority trades. Employers are also eligible for an equal payment. The 8,010 trainees who have signed up for the reboot subsidy and for apprenticeships by 10 October compares to the normal sign-up rate of around 7,000 for a full year. With the reboot and New Zealand apprenticeships, we had an estimated that around 14,000 new apprentices, extra new apprentices, will start training over the next five years, over and above the 7,000 who enrol normally. Uh, we're currently running ahead of that at this point. The Tertiary Education Commission expects the 10,000th trainee will sign up for the reboot before the end of this calendar year. Because of the strong uptake of the reboot, the government is now investigating investing more money into extending the number of places eligible for the subsidy. The Apprenticeship Reboot and the New Zealand Apprenticeships are part of the government's move to a more results focus in industry training that compares to the history of what we inherited. We had up to about 100,000 phantom trainees in courses who achieved no credits. Our apprenticeship changes are making a significant contribution towards meeting the better public services target of 55% of 25 to 34 year olds with at least a level four qualification, because the apprenticeships involved are all at level four. It is also helping more young people gain the skills they and our country need to take up the opportunities, uh, particularly uh, construction industry growth, uh, but also in other industries right across the country. And the paper that's been distributed has a list of uh, apprentices by region. So happy to take any questions on that and also on the America's Cup. How many extra apprentices do you think the um, extension could, could see created? Uh, it's a little just—it's a little hard to say at this point. I mean, obviously there's budgetary considerations, um, and uh, around shaking the tin at the TEC, and uh, so far I haven't quite got the numbers that we'll be able to do. But certainly we're keen to uh, take up the opportunities we can, because what we are seeing is uh, significant growth in a number of industries, and it's important to keep uh, uh, to keep those skills coming through. And there's a real in, a real interest, particularly in the building industry to hire more apprentices. Is it enough given the Reserve Bank has signalled um, that you know, the maybe imported labour to help with the construction booms across each other? Well, we're always going to need and get some imported labour. That's the reality of the, uh, the movements in the construction industry. So the, the growth in the construction industry comes from about four areas. Firstly, the uh, construction industry is one where people tend to move away from it in tougher times and then move back. Secondly, you've really got an, an Australasian job market now, and we know we lost a lot of 
uh, tradespeople uh, when Australia was having uh, their resources boom. As you can see from the latest uh, statistics released today on immigration, uh, that's really turning the other way now. We're seeing quite a few people coming back across the Tasman, and that will help augment it. Uh, thirdly, you have the training element to it, and uh, that's uh, what we've been talking about today. And then fourthly, of course, you will see some coming from offshore as well. So it's a combination of all four of those things. The 10 New Zealand funding, is that more a rescheme to New Zealand indicated they might need? A little bit less than they indicated they might, might need at this stage. Uh, but they have agreed to go off and uh, see if they can uh, find the balance elsewhere. With the, the balance was around developing uh, some of the technologies they wanted to at this stage, and we said that's fine, that's great. Um, uh, see if you can uh, find some other sponsorship for that. We think five million is about right for our contribution at this point. Well, Dr. 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 No, there's no conditions at this point. I think um, I've had advice from both Grant and Dean Barker directly that that's their intention is to stay on and be part of the team. Although they've also been very clear, both of them actually, that, um, that they shouldn't have their positions as of right and that should always be tested over the next three or four years. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that they both intend to stay part of the team. Uh, the $5 million will help keep some key people uh, and uh, then they are in the process of building up a uh, a challenge approach, uh, which uh, they hope to finalise by about April, May of next year. What would you say to those who might question why you're putting five million dollars into a, to a yacht race, and, and at the same time you've got industries in Shannon and a sawmill and Lower Rua going, you know, going down the Hugo and jobs being lost in those regions? I think it's really important that we uh, understand why we do this. We're not just interested in putting five million dollars into a yacht race. Uh, the real benefit out of this is the exposure it gives New Zealand and its exporters in the largest economy in the world, which is the USA. And uh, I think we can all agree, uh, partly as a result of the result not being quite what we intended, uh, that, uh, that the level of exposure, the level of visibility of New Zealand in that market uh, was greatly enhanced over the period of the regatta. Uh, and there's been direct benefit from that for our ICT industry, our food and beverage industry, our uh, uh, technology industries like the marine industry and so on, who have obtained real uh, profile and benefit out of that, and as, as New Zealand as a whole. So that's the reason you do this sort of thing. Uh, in terms of the particular companies that you raise, my understanding is that both of them have issues that, that are related to their industry, uh, and the reality is that the, the jobs are created and lost in the New Zealand economy every year. It's tough for the individuals involved. Uh, but in terms of lifting New Zealand's profile on the world stage and helping us grow our exports, that's important for every export-based business. How much, do, how much did it lift on the world stage? Because, I mean, in the States, yachting and the America's Cup was a minority sport. Certainly didn't get anywhere near the coverage it got here. Well, ironically, um, partly because of the way the regatta unfolded, it got much broader coverage. Uh, uh, so, for example, the price you put and the value you put on a, a colour photo on the front page of the New York Times, level of coverage in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the last day that I was there, uh, the morning of the San Francisco Chronicle, had not just one, but four stories, the front page, the middle of the front news section, the front of the sports section, and so on. And that was going on uh, for a significant period of time. San Francisco itself is a huge beachhead for New Zealand businesses into the USA by virtue of Silicon Valley, the Kiwi landing pad, our food and beverage arrangements up there with wine and so on. Uh, so I think you'd have to say that Northern California alone is pretty important. California is important, and in the benefit, admittedly in a, in a lower level compared to California across the rest of the country, is very beneficial for New Zealand. And there's not many things that have moved the dial, I'd add Hobbit movies, Prime Minister, uh, in that way, in that market uh, for New Zealand over the last three or four years. Um, and so on that basis, you have to properly assess each time uh, is this the thing that you want to put your investment in? And uh, we think on the strength of the outcome in terms of exposure for this country, it's certainly worth looking seriously at again, and we're prepared to put the five million up in the meantime uh, to give the opportunity to see if we can uh, you know, support the team in putting a challenge together. What happens if they don't put a challenge together? What happens to the five million? Uh, the five million dollars is basically um, is, is a cost to us. So it's not money that we'd be able to get back, Patty. Uh, the uh, the reality is that's a, that's a speculative part of the investment. If they su succeed in a challenge, uh, then of course it would form part of the subsequent sponsorship. I note that that's a s we've been here before. Uh, we've seen these things in the past. The previous government actually put up $10 million in 2007. 
Uh, we've been able to tie that down to five this time, uh, but uh, nevertheless, you get to that point where uh, you either um, provide a little bit of support to get the team underway again, or alternatively, you, 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 you lose that opportunity. Does the Is government look into um, ways of getting out of the um, both government contracts in recent Yes, we did. Um, and that was part of our response to the global financial crisis, which, uh, as you will recall, we were trying to stop every bit of uh, expenditure that wasn't nailed down to focus it on the areas that, uh, that, you know, that we were worried about. Uh, I think at that time... If you had, if you had been able to get out of it, would you have got out of it at that point? Well, I, I, certainly, I, I wasn't the minister at the time. It's something as a government we would have looked at, but it didn't actually come to pass because ultimately uh, it wasn't pretty something pretty, that we could move from. Pretty lucky, pretty lucky, isn't it? Well, it's worked out okay for everybody. It's worked out okay for New Zealand, which is really important because I think even even prior to the regatta, there was you know, quite a lot of people saying, oh, this isn't worth the investment, but actually a lot more post the regatta have said, surprising just how high a profile New Zealand got as a result of that competition. Uh, and on that basis, I think we've all reassessed a little bit. The whole what's, the, what's the message does it seem like for some industries, <coughs> you're picking winners, aren't you, and some industries are clearly losing? I don't think that's right in this instance, because it's not about a single industry. Uh, I know the marine industry would say it's very important for them and that's great, but it's actually about a whole range of industries. What does it say about New Zealand on the world stage? It says that we're innovative, that we're high technology, great design, great engineers. That's about the whole of New Zealand industry. That's not just about a particular part of it, so that's why it's very important. How many people short of what team New Zealand wanted? How much did they have they need? Well, they were seeking about six and a half million at this stage, and we've, we've uh, made the five. Are there any uh, well, obviously, they've got to uh, spend it on the things that we've agreed, but so beyond that... Do you have any say or right of veto over, say, a sponsor you don't like? Well, no, because the, the next stage of it would be them coming and saying, here's the plan, here's the America's Cup um, arrangements, here's where it's being held, here's what sort of yachts it is, here's the other sponsors we've been able to assemble, are you keen to go ahead or not? And that's our opportunity uh, to, to assess uh, what we would want to do at that point. So, so what happens with this right of veto if, for argument's sake, Kim.com? Well, I mean, I... Yeah, or someone, or someone along that. Well, we haven't, we haven't sought a right of veto as such. Uh, my um, humble view of dear old Kim is that if he wants to get on uh, into the America's Cup, he should pop up to San Francisco and lay his challenge on the table. I'm sure they'd like to see him. How many people will this money then go to, uh, go to and what do you expect to spend it on? Is it to help with development at this stage, or is it something? Um, it's, it's firstly to help retain some of their key people. So you've got a whole lot of other challenges that are sniffing around now. They want the designers, they want the top yachties, they want the top support crew and all those sort of things. So this will help them to continue on uh, with uh, those people and, and, and hold them for a period of time. It will also help them begin the, uh, the preparations uh, for another campaign, including, of course, the sponsorships, the uh, liaison with people that... Um, with, with Larry Ellison's crew and the, and the America's Cup defenders and setting up the protocol. We'll also help them uh, start to develop their design aspirations in terms of what they want to do. The reality is they can't sit still until the middle of next year. Uh, they need to act a bit as if they're already underway so that they don't lose ground and suddenly turn up uh, and everybody else is six months ahead of them. So that's their challenge. Um, my view of it is that this is the sort of thing that they're probably up for. How many, how many people... I don't have those numbers with me today, um, but I'll, I'll make some for us. How much extra do you think the government might have to put in if it gets to the next stage? Well, it's all subject to the number of sponsorships. We've signaled to them, I've signaled to them, that the sort of money we would be interested in would be no more um, than the 30, the, the well, 36 million last time, so in the 30 to 40 million range. That would be that would be about where the government sits, but I have to stress that I haven't even been to Cabinet with those numbers yet, so Prime Minister might have a different view. Um, and uh, uh, but the, but I think we wanted to signal pretty clearly for them that it would be on a similar basis, on a one for two basis, uh, and uh, um, and so as they didn't think entirely different numbers to what had been there in the past. So that's thirty to forty on top of the five. No, it would be no. The five is included in that final. So will we see some kind of cost benefit analysis from MSP or MP configuration? What we will see is a review evaluation of the the most recent one, which will help to inform the decision as to whether we proceed with another um, you know, big sponsorship support. 
uh, and also an assessment based on you know, where that's being held, uh, for example, whether it continues to be at San Francisco or wherever, uh, and those sorts of questions. So there'll be an estimate, yes. But again, I would stress that some of the stuff is is uh, is quite speculative, so you do your best and then you have to make a judgment. Cool. That, be really important? that would be the intent. Is more of that money be contributed before team using the side as a challenge? Or more money that no, the five would be the maximum until such time as um, as uh, they've made a final decision to challenge and we've made an assessment as to whether we want to support. What's the time frame for that decision? Or? Well, realistically, uh, they're unlikely to know the way in which the next cup is run until uh, end of first quarter next year. So we're talking sometime between March and May, I suspect. And are you, are you concerned that there was some brand It's one of the things that we'll look at is whether we've got sufficient branding for our investment, and that's definitely one of the things that we want to assess along some other things. So yeah, we'd, we'd be looking for improvements as part of any investment as well, as I'm sure every other sponsor would. So if it came to that, we'd probably have to fight over this debate. So would that involve giving the Oh, no, it's not going to get into that. That's, um, that's between uh, Team New Zealand and their sponsors. Coach Meridian, Tiffany Winter. Well, you just never know your luck in the big city, Claire. Okay, I'm happy now we'll move on to other matters and situations across the ditch in Australia. As you'll be aware, a state of emergency has been called across New South Wales in Australia due to the worsening situation with the bushfires. Authorities there are describing this as the worst fire crisis in New South Wales in 45 years. Uh, earlier this afternoon I rang New South Wales Premier uh, Barry O'Farrell to get an update on the situation and to reiterate that New Zealand remains ready to assist if requested. There are standing arrangements in place whereby state governments in Australia can ask New Zealand for assistance to fight bushfires. Mr O'Farrell thanked me for the call and said the situation was serious, uh, with a forecast for high temperatures, low humidity and high winds over the next few days. It would be a challenging week. He said he was aware of the capabilities available from New Zealand, including uh, from our assistance around the bushfires in January this year, would not hesitate to call for help if it was needed. Now I got the impression it was likely that we would send people at some stage. In terms of the House this week, the government will look to progress the Telecommunications Interception Capability uh, Act Amendment Bill, members of Parliament Remuneration and Services Bill and the Health and Safety Pipe River Implementation Bill. Wednesday is a Members' Day. Uh, just in terms of my own activities this week, I'm in Wellington tomorrow and Wednesday for the usual caucus and house activities. On Thursday, I'll be in Central Otago for a range of events, and on Friday, I'll be in Auckland uh, for mainly private events. What would that assistance to New South Wales look like? How many people? Don't know at this stage. I mean, the conversation I had with him, he uh, is obviously assessing you know, the current situation, which is clearly serious. He, uh, I think, New Zealand uh, firefighters had participated. In School had taken place this morning, and certainly the indi early indications they got was likely that some of that specialist um, technology and people that we have would be deployed across the Tasman plant at this early stage. We've got another couple of examples in the last couple of days of regional businesses really struggling. Um, are you concerned that this is a trend and that um, what do we suppose are losing their jobs? Well, firstly, I think um, my top level understanding of both of those businesses is that the issues are specific to them. I don't think they're any part of any great regional trend. So the, the sawmill in Rotorua, there's something specific happening there. In fact, the general advice I've had is that they're looking to sell that business potentially as a going concern. So we would hope that those employees, or as many as possible, would be able to move over to the new buyer, assuming there is one. In terms of uh, the situation in Shannon, that's a situation brought about because their resource consent's running out in the next couple of years. They're actually moving the business up to another region. So it is a situation where it's going from one part of the country to another part of the country in probability. Uh, so, look, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, it's always very um, difficult for people when they lose their job. But overall, if you look at the census and you look at the growth numbers around the country, they've actually been pretty strong. 15 of the 16 uh, uh, regions around New Zealand have had population growth. Many of them have a, a regional economic growth rate, which is actually higher than Auckland's. We've been looking at our per capita government spend around the country, and it's pretty even everywhere. Uh, we, we are rolling out some significant initiatives that will help the regions, particularly you know, things like ultra-fast broadband. 
Yeah. So, I mean, overall, you know, there's a lot to be optimistic about if you look at the Reserve Bank and Treasury forecasts and the tax take the government's getting. All of those look very impressive to me. So, you know, I think um, generally people can feel a lot more chipper about the economy than they would have five years ago. The unions are saying that um, there are imports of uh, mill timber from Chile and Canada into the Christchurch River. Does this make sense to, have to be importing timber but shutting down sawmills? Well, I don't have all of those details. Like I said, that sawmill, is, there's a specific issue there and they're looking for a buyer, so that mill isn't necessarily shutting down. Secondly, actually, we've been doing pretty well in terms of exports of our uh, both logs and processed timber. But one of the big things we can do is get completion of some of these free trade agreements. Like, for instance, Korea is a big market from New Zealand's perspective for wood, but the lack of the FTA means that there are quite heavy restrictions going into the Korean market. So again, if we could resolve those issues, we'd be in good shape. But if you think about what we know, there's going to be almost certainly construction boom, both in the retail sector and, uh, sorry, residential sector and the commercial sector in the next few years. And that's certainly going to see a big demand for timber. Are you worried about these migration numbers showing you know, back towards 20,000 net uh, a year, uh, putting quite a bit of pressure on the housing market, I guess, in particular? Well, there's two things. Firstly, it's a, probably a sign of success that the migration numbers are, are positive. It means the less people are going across uh, the ditch to try and find opportunities. Uh, there's more and increasing confidence in the New Zealand economy. And actually, we see the unemployment rate falling. I mean, a lot of the predictions we see from Treasury, Reserve Bank and others is that unemployment will likely have a five in front of it in the foreseeable future. So, uh, yes, it puts some pressure on the housing market, but you know, the government has demonstrated how serious it is about supply. Uh, we have these special housing areas in Auckland. And in fact, my understanding is we are tracking literally week by week the consents coming out of the Auckland Council. They have been running at just the same rate, in fact, an increasing rate, post the LBR restrictions as they were prior to it. So the argument that there'll be less houses built, you know, three weeks into it isn't, isn't demonstrating any of it. So isn't it worry that um, this is just going to put further pressure on the Reserve Bank and cancel out any of the gains that might have been made by the LBRs in terms of interest rate rates? Yeah, look, you, you can always see, so it depends whether you believe the glass is half full or it's half empty. Um, I'm in the you know, kind of half full category, which says some of the people coming in will have skills that we can bring uh, to help speed up the process, they'll be specialists in certain areas. Secondly, it's, you know, it's a positive sign that the New Zealand economy is growing and New Zealand is a place to want to live. We just need to continue to work on those supply issues and consenting 39,000 new homes over a three year period, as opposed to our previous run rate in the last three years, which have been about 12,000, is a clear demonstration. And if other political parties want to help us in that process, well, they'll continue to support us with things like RMA reform. Um, the Have you got the numbers on that yet? On the RMA? Get it close. The latest uh, Ministry for Environment Report has been uh, projecting greater emissions by 2040 than they did last year. Um, Kennedy Graham says that's largely the result of changes to the ETS. Do you have any concerns about that? Um, no, I don't think that's right. There's a, there's a number of different factors. I think a lot of the, part of the issue is because some of the 1990 forests were milled, and so they're distorting the figures slightly. But look, overall, I, I think if you look at what New Zealand is doing, um, we're on the right track. What is certainly true is that you know, uh, emissions trading schemes around the world and the price of carbon have collapsed because you know, economic activity prices have been pretty low. But I think the government's tracking um, broadly the right path. We're certainly um, sticking to our goal. We've, we've got both 2020 targets and, and a 50 year target we're, um, we're addressing. But that longer term target for the environment shot right up. Yeah, yeah. like I say, partly as I understand because of some of the distortions in the numbers. But if you were to beat that 2050 target, you would have a sudden contraction about 2014, which would be. Yeah, I think you've got to be a bit careful about here in sort of 2013, you know, putting too much credence into what's going to happen in 27 years from now when it comes to climate change, because the reality is that half of all of our emissions come from nitrate and methane emissions um, from agriculture. The greenhouse, Global Greenhouse Gas Alliance is working on technological solutions, and actually that could be quite binary. In other words, it's quite possible we come up with a scientific solution that sees a dramatic reduction in those emissions. It's not going to be necessarily a kind of um, slow linear reduction. So actually I'm of the view that um, you know, science is going to be our friend when it comes to this area.
consultant. Did they indicate where they were going? No. They always consult with a high level and say what they think. Do you tend to get lobbied by MPs over remuneration? No. Well, we understand this year it's going to be discussed in the light of day rather than the dead of night. Anything behind that? Well, I hope they do. I mean, it's they are completely independent. They make the decisions. They have to, I think, either legally are required to actually consult, and they do consult. But typically, they announce it the week after Parliament's broken up and a week before Christmas. Typically, I get banged for the decision that they make, and it's nothing to do with me. I'm happy to express my views, but they are truly and totally independent. So if they want to do it earlier, and you know, in the full light of day, I'll continue to make the same comments I make, and I hope you guys will report that they are independent and are free to make their own decisions. Is that part of your submission? <laughs> No. Sorry, <laughs> no, it wasn't that. But the debate club will be I during so. the day. I, I mean, so. in terms of the Met Parliament. So, so why, why is that? Why are you guys? I don't know. I mean, that's a matter for me. And are we talking about uh, an increase around the rate of inflation? Is that what's acceptable to you? Uh, yeah, that would be the top end, yeah. I think you're talking about the remuneration bill. You're talking about the remuneration bill. That's different. That's a completely different matter from the REM authority. The REM bill is going through because we gave commitments that we would um, give greater transparency in those areas and, and also change in authority. And essentially what it means is for certain aspects of travel, spousal travel and the likes, that, will, that authority will move from being something that's decided by the Speaker of Parliamentary Services to, to independent authority um, with, the, with the one change that was fully and unanimously supported by the overall committee and that was to keep parliamentarians travel continuing to be administered by the speaker. Just going back to Colin Craig, do, yep. do you accept that you could um, alienate some of your own force if you were to um, form some kind of arrangement with a, a budget for a Christian organisation, particularly among women voters and liberal nationalists? Yes, so any, any political party that we join forces with, um, if that's required to put together a government, will have positives and minuses. So, yeah, at the end of the day, if we, if we do another deal with ACT and the back in Parliament, people will say they're quite right wing. If we do a deal with the United Future, people will say, well, there's some things like them they don't like, the Murray Party, there's some things they don't like, Colin Craig, Winston Peters, it's all the same. And there are always pluses and minuses. Uh, in the end, all I know is that MMP is a coalition driven system. So Germany's had one, one time in its history where it's had a majority government. We've never managed to achieve that. Uh, Angela Merkel is effectively almost going to get an outright majority of 42.5%, but still needs to form a coalition, and actually it looks like it's a grand coalition with effectively the Labour Party in Germany. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't create the system. I gave people a chance to express their view on it in 2011. They expressed their view, they wanted to keep it on, on that basis. I've got to do what any other political leader does, and that is do my best to ensure there's a national lead government from 2014 supported by as many parties that would give us a parliamentary majority. I'm sure David Cumberland will do the same for later. What's your view of um, elements of the National Party getting dragged into the land by Brexit? Well, I don't think it's true to say that the National Party is involved. Um, we're not involved in local government. Uh, we're not part of CNR. Um, there may be people that are associated with it who are also members of the National Party, but that's also like saying they're all, they may also be part of the Catholic Church. I mean, that, that's just other things that they do. How would you feel as members of your staff or your cabinet working regularly with Congressman of yours? Well, there will be people that talk to him, just like there will be people that talk to all sorts of other people out there. I, I can't and don't control who they speak to. It's for them to decide that. Um, it's their call. Well, I'm not going to go to my MPs and say, you, you can talk to this person, you can't talk to another. I think we're not in a Stalinist state, state. So at the end of the day, they're free to make their own decisions. What I can tell you is, the National Party, as a political party, is not behind this. The first I knew about was literally when someone said to me, get a look at this blog site in the yeah. House last week. You said you're angry, but what about members of your staff and your cabinet? Well, I mean, again, I'm not involved in, in, in that. I have no knowledge of that. So. Do you, think, do you think the climate's changed now since this new ground right. I don't know. Um, I don't think it's the whole thing that's happened will be welcomed actually by anybody. It's, um, I mean, people, some people have a range of different views, but, but fundamentally in Parliament, my view's always been that we want to attract people into Parliament 
and actually very few people have lived a life of blameless excellence. I mean, most people will have something they've done prior to coming into Parliament that they're ashamed of, or at least they're not happy with, or they wish they could have done differently. Um, and we don't want to deter people from coming in because we think that they've got to meet a standard that very, very few people meet. That might be different later on. It's for other people to judge what they do in the, either in the local government or in Parliament. Do you have something that you're ashamed of? I don't. No, I not really. <laughs> I'm not about not to really. make, make something that I'm terribly worried about. No. Yeah. Well, there's always uh, there's always risks. I mean, there's 121 people in Parliament, and like I said, yeah, I, I don't know all the things they get up to or don't get up to. But over the years, I've had plenty of people to bring me up with information about Labour and Peas, and I've done the same thing to every person that's rung me. I've written it down, put it in my top drawer, and kept it to myself. I'm just not interested in engaging. Have you given any of your MPs a warning that this is what could happen now? Well, we haven't had a caucus meeting since then, because it came out on Tuesday afternoon. Um, but I, I've regularly given them a warning that they are in the public spotlight, not, not because of necessarily what's going on in Auckland, but just generally in terms of the way they carry themselves out, the way they treat other members of the public. I mean, there's a higher expectation on MPs than there is on others, and rightfully so. And I expect my MPs to treat people well, politely, civility and decent manners. And would you be giving them another warning? Would well I can do, but I don't think I really need to. But, yeah. Can we RIA your chop drawer? You can't <laughs> RIA my chop drawer, but I wonder if I write a book you'll find it quite fascinating. <laughs> it's amazing who rings up. And that's the note. Must go. Time's mine.